Ladies and gentlemen, would you please take your seats? Thank you. I'm Rob O'Connor, the Master of Ceremonies for tonight's event. Would you please stand and face the shrine for the recital of the Ode of Remembrance by Cottesloe RSL Past State President Harold Durant. I shall throw my gold if we shall let go. I shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Lest we forget. Lest we forget. Thank you. Please be seated. A special welcome this evening to the following. Who worship the Mayor of the Town of Cottesloe, Joe Dawkins, Councillors of the Town of Cottesloe, Acting President Cottesloe RSL, Jonathan Sciatino and his wife Bronwyn, Cottesloe RSL Past President Harold Durant and his wife, Past Secretary of Cottesloe RSL, Lynn Durant, immediate past president of Cottesloe RSL and past Frederick Bell VC lecturer, Dr Neville Green AM and his wife, past secretary of Cottesloe RSL, Mary Green, who worship the mayor of the town of Cambridge, Kerry Shannon, the inaugural Frederick Bell VC lecturer, Ruth Marchant James, OAM, and I'm pleased to announce that she's found her medal. <laughs> Last year's Frederick Bell VC lecturer, Dr. Philippa Martin. This year's Frederick Bell VC lecturer, Shannon Lovelady and her husband, Ross. We have had many apologies for this evening many of whom have been in personal touch to express their disappointment that they cannot attend this evening and to extend their best wishes for the success of tonight. They include Governor-General, His Excellency Sir Peter Cosgrove AK, the Governor, Her Excellency Kerry Sanderson AO, the former Governor-General and Governor, Michael Jeffrey, ACAOMC, the former Governor, the Honourable Malcolm McCusker, ACCVOQC, the Premier and MLA for Cottesloe, the Honourable Colin Barnett, the WA State President of the RSL, Graham Edwards AM, who is on RSL business in Northampton, attending an RSL dinner. The Foreign Minister and Member for Curtin, Julie Bishop. The Honourable Dr Brendan Nelson, Director Australian War Memorial, Canberra. The State Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Honourable Joe Francis. Former Frederick Bell VC lecturer, Rabbi Shalom Coleman AM, who is on religious duties tonight and Professor Peter Stanley, Centre for the Australian War Studies and Society in Canberra. A very warm welcome to the 165 of you here this evening. The very high number is a great tribute to the very high esteem with which Shannon is held in our community. Cottesloe RSL holds this lecture annually and this is the sixth lecture. The lecture commemorates Lieutenant Frederick Bell VC, a former resident of Cottesloe, who was the first Western Australian to be awarded the Victoria Cross, the highest award available for valour by a soldier in the face of the enemy. Fred Bell received his VC for his valour, gallantry and bravery during the Boer War in South Africa on 16 May 1901. The citation for Fred Bell's feat is set out in the leaflet which accompanied the invitation to this event 
and there are some on the seats this evening. This evening's lecturer is Shannon Lovelady, who will speak on Gallipoli Dead from Western Australia, Naming Those Lost. Shannon is the archivist at Presbyterian Ladies College. For 20 years, she has conducted a consultancy business called House and Heritage Research, involving family history genealogy research and the history of old houses and the people who have lived in them over the generations. She can tell many stories of her successes in uncovering and resolving mysteries in researching those matters. Shannon became aware that no one knew the answer to the question, how many Western Australians died at or as a result of Gallipoli. Surprisingly, the experts all said that it was impossible to answer that question. There were no such records. Undeterred by the tag of Mission Impossible, Shannon was confident that with her researching skills and her dedication to the task, she could make the impossible possible. She set up on her own the Gallipoli Dead from Western Australia project and then co-opted 30 volunteers to help carry out the research which she directed. She was the mastermind of the project and was its outstanding leader. The remarkable feature of the project was that it was done by Shannon on a volunteer basis. She did not get paid any remuneration for doing it and she had no grants or subsidies from any government or other source. I first learnt of the project when Shannon spoke about it to a History Council of Western Australia meeting at Fremantle 18 months ago. In that talk, I learnt that Shannon was publishing weekly articles in Brett Christian's Post newspaper, which told stories of individual Western Australians who were killed at Gallipoli. That is how most people became aware of Shannon and her wonderful research work. There were 62 of those weekly stories which concluded at Anzac Day this year, the centenary of the Anzac landing. 2015 has been a very busy year for Shannon. The school at which she is the archivist, PLC, has been celebrating its centenary this year and she has had an important role in that. She has also presented several talks and given interviews on her Gallipoli Dead project. Recently, Shannon was awarded the Pride of Workmanship by the Rotary Club of Freshwater Bay for her work on the Gallipoli Dead from Western Australia project. Tonight, Shannon will give us a comprehensive explanation of her project, a summary of the wealth of statistics which she has compiled from the information gained in the research, details of some of her most interesting individual stories, how the information has been used by her and others, and what the project could inspire for the future. Western Australia is the only state which knows the number and names of its Gallipoli dead. Shannon has the intellectual property and know-how as to what the other states need to do to determine similar information for their states and she is prepared to provide that know-how to the other states. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Shannon a very warm welcome as I invite her to present this year's Frederick Bell VC Memorial Lecture. Thank you. you all for coming. As Rob has already done a wonderful job of acknowledging each of our dignitaries by name, I won't repeat them, but to them and to everyone else, I will now add how pleased and honoured I am that all of you are here. 
Like many of you, I've enjoyed several Frederick Bell VC Memorial Lectures and am very proud to be standing here this time as speaker. Tonight, as we near the end of the Anzac centenary, I want to share with you how the Gallipoli Dead from Western Australia project eventuated, how we accomplished it, and some of the raw statistics we're now able to examine because of it. But also some of the stories we've uncovered along the way to naming those lost. Sons and brothers, uncles and nephews, husbands, fathers, neighbours and mates who may have enlisted to see the world and seek adventure but were soon confronted by the shocking reality that was hell on earth. I will share some of the incredible stories of wives and families who quietly had their hearts torn out by their loved one's death, but who accepted their duty in handing them over for king and country, and sometimes for their dear boy to pay the ultimate price. But first I'll explain how the project came about. I'm the archivist, curator and historian for Presbyterian Ladies College, which as Rob said, is currently celebrating its centenary this year. In 2013, I was researcher for Dr Susan Masshart as she prepared to write our centenary history. The middle of World War I being an unusual time to start a school, Susan sought to put that into context and asked the Fremantle Army Museum, several military academics and other relevant sources how many West Australians were killed at Gallipoli. To our surprise, most responses were the same. First they asked if we meant casualties, which could mean anything, so we clarified we wanted to know how many died. Then came the admissions that no one knew. And no one had worked it out because it was considered impossible. With enlistments in the region of 420,000, 32,000 wounded and missing, and 62,000 killed, these figures had successfully put everyone off examining them more closely for 98 years. Wes Olson, author of Gallipoli, the Western Australian chapter, provided an honest appraisal of the difficulties faced in trying to determine that number and gave us his closest estimate of between 900 killed and 2,500 wounded and missing, with the actual figure somewhere in there. In his email, he said he'd take his hat off to whoever could work it out, and I found that irresistible. When we met last year, he said, I believe I need to doff my hat to you. I have a background in IT and database administration. I'm also an experienced military and family history researcher, and although my personal interest in World War I is the Western Front, I felt if I gathered a group of like-minded people to collaborate with, we could work this out. I saw clearly how we should go about it, methodically and strategically, from the thin end of the wedge, and that was with deaths and not enlistments, which is contrary to what others thought should be the logical starting point. The first thing to determine was, what is a West Australian? Is it someone born in WA? Is it someone who was born elsewhere but enlisted in WA? Is it someone born in Hobart who enlisted from Adelaide but spent part of his life here? The answer to all is yes, with the last group the most difficult to identify. I then set the eligibility criteria that each soldier must have been born in or enlisted from WA, or lived here for some time, and their death must have been as a direct result of their Gallipoli service, before the 31st of August 1921. That was the date determined many years ago by the forerunner of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission for official consideration as war dead. Obviously, a lot of war service records needed examination, but the other thing to remember is these men were never really forgotten. Not by the army, not by the government, or their families and friends. We just needed to find them. With all our World War I records freely available online from the National Archives of Australia, the only cost would be time. It did not look impossible to me. At this point, it hit me how sad this research would be. There were no happy endings here counting the dead. And later, I did have one dedicated Queensland volunteer withdraw because he found the feelings of sadness, loss and pointlessness overwhelming and his post-traumatic stress resurfaced. But mindful of this, and the fact that plenty is written about those who returned, I knew we owed it to these men to not just know how many there were, but who they were, good and bad, in the true spirit of lest we forget. Some careful thought and a few days later, I went to the first meeting of the WA Interest Group of the WA Genealogical Society and floated the idea of collaborating on the project. It was well received and later that day, I had my first research volunteers, some of whom are here tonight. 
I then recruited several school and small archives colleagues and some friends and family. More came through word of mouth and in the end I had about 30. Everyone shared my surprise that no one knew how many of our men died at Gallipoli. Everyone saw the value in collaborating to find out. The project's name, Gallipoli Dead from Western Australia, was specifically chosen so other states could take on theirs. Gallipoli Dead from New South Wales, Victoria and so on. I did start South Australia and Tasmania, but no one was willing to take on the responsibility or make the commitment for nothing. I've got the recipe though, as Rob said, and I'm happy to share. As word spread, offers of lists from other Gallipoli and World War I researchers rolled in. The list of plaques in the King's Park Honour Avenues, the 10th Light Horse Honour Roll, and the Roll of Honour from the Western Mail's Christmas 1915 edition. I then asked some authors and military historians for their lists and honour rolls. Some I'd had contact with in the past, others I hadn't. Military historians and authors, hosts of online World War I databases, and people researching their local war memorial or honour board, without any hesitation, generously gave me years of their own research. No one said no. When I saw the very first list come in, I realised I couldn't hand over the data management side to anyone else, as I'd originally thought, as I like my data to have the highest integrity, and the only way I could ensure that was to do it myself. That was a big decision. I have a husband and three kids, two of whom were at uni at the time and one halfway through year 12. At work, PLC was gearing up to the biggest year in its history. I was already busy, and going to get a lot busier. But as they say, if you want something done, ask a busy person. And having made that decision, I got on with researching which WA regiments and battalions went to Gallipoli and extracted those deaths from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. They were primarily the 3rd Field Artillery Brigade, the 10th Light Horse Regiment, and the 11th, 12th, 16th and 28th Battalions. I then made a contact at Commonwealth War Graves Commission who extracted the same data from the back end of their database plus any with any mention of WA in their record. Later, Marjorie Bly from the National Archives kindly extracted every WA enlistment for me as a double check. All of these lists, that's just a tiny percentage of it, and smaller projects merged into a massive juggernaut, but it was a great starting point. After cleaning it up and weeding out myriad duplicates and aliases, there were around 4,000 men needing examination. A lot, yes but not so overwhelming when broken down into smaller pieces. I sent my volunteers an Excel spreadsheet of 10 men with the battalion or regi regiment to identify them and column headings for the information I needed extracted. Consulting the B2455 series of war service records online through the National Archives, they would extract the information and send them back. It seems strange, but I haven't met all of these volunteers, and in fact I only met Shelley Yo, who's here tonight for the first time just a few moments ago. When we all got together a bit later, we found we'd all felt the least we could do for each man was to look at every single page of his dossier. They generally run from between 50 to 150 pages. Of the volunteers, most became firmly addicted and sent their completed lists back with just one word, more. No more fever. <laughs> Others said it effectively lowered their nightly alcohol consumption, so you could say volunteering had its health benefits too. When someone had sent me a completed list, I felt it was important to send them a new list the same day. Sometimes I did 17 lists a night, and if that was a work day for me, that took me well into the wee small hours. But that's one of the beauties of this project. Volunteers could participate as little or as much as they liked, in their jammies, on the couch, in the middle of the night if they wished, and that was me too. For that reason, this project is unique, as it was conducted entirely online. And so, in lists of 10, the research volunteers and I slowly, slowly chewed through the service records of those 4,000 soldiers. We ate an elephant, one bite at a time. I did have a few naysayers though. Professor Peter Stanley from the University of New South Wales, one of the few in whose opinion I invested, was probably the most discouraging. He admired my stamina and optimism, but argued the records were not good enough. He was researching for his book, Lost Boys of Anzac at the time, focusing on those who died on the day of the landing. And for his purposes, no, I agree, the records are frustratingly imprecise, 
and many who died on the 25th of April have a recorded date of death of the 2nd of May, because that was the first opportunity they had to have a roll call. But I was just counting if they died, not when, and the records are perfect for that. I also know how to tackle mass data. There is a peace and a passion within it I find soothing. I knew I could do this, so I ignored the naysayers. Later, I sent Peter the completed list. He was very impressed, and that was enormously satisfying. <laughs> As the project gathered speed in those first days, I set up the Gallipoli Dead from Western Australia Facebook group. It had about 550 members, well, it's still active, uh, but it's quite quiet now. But it was very busy when it was in full swing. Feel free to join. We do still have very interesting discussions up there. A wonderful, unexpected consequence of this group and sharing this in the global community of Facebook was uniting family members of the Gallipoli Dead from Western Australia soldiers across the world and providing a platform on which to exchange photos and stories about these men. Like Daniel Nolan from Victoria, who asked for information about his relative, Tom Henley. He was going to Hill 60 at Gallipoli to honour him on the centenary of his death on the 29th of August. So grateful for the wealth of information offered to him by the group, he asked if he could pay tribute to any other men in our list. I gave him a list of about 40 names of men who died that day, mostly from the 10th Light Horse and the 16th Battalion. Others contributed their soldiers' names too, and when that day dawned at Gallipoli, he read out poems and heartfelt dedications from everyone, plus a list of 130 names, each man remembered. He then found and photographed the graves we wanted and placed personal mementos from those back here. Rather special too is several dozen Turkish war guides and military historians who joined and have been supporting our efforts from afar. But that's a happy consequence. The actual purpose of this group was to ask other respected researchers, military experts, authors and academics for their opinions on cases I lacked the time to investigate more fully. Sometimes it was whether a man landed at Gallipoli at all. Sometimes it was a matter of determining whether their cause of death was due to their Gallipoli service. This is Royce Beju from Albany, just before he embarked and just after he returned. Bit of a change, isn't it? He'd served only a few months at Gallipoli, but while there, endured some of the worst shelling of the entire campaign. Hospitalised with shell shock, he was then sent to France, where he served several more months, most of it in hospital and in the short time he was back in the field, he was blown up once again. In 1917, he was invalided home, where he married and had a son, who was still living, aged 98, and died in 1918. I needed to know if Beige's death was a result of his Gallipoli service, or as I suspected, from his longer time on the Western Front. Project contributor Sandra Plow, who's here this evening, was all for be inclusive, not exclusive, but I couldn't just wish someone into eligibility or the integrity of the whole study would be compromised. Andrew Pitterway, who's also here, Fremantle archivist and project contributor, pointed out there was a medical file at the National Archives that we should examine. Marjorie Bly from the National Archives kindly expressed access to that file for us and in a trip that took almost as much organisation as the Gallipoli landing itself, Sandra, project researcher Claire Greer, and I went out to examine his file. It was terribly sad reading. Royce had suffered an increasing number of debilitating strokes in the months leading up to his death. Because he'd been in such close proximity to that bombing at Gallipoli, percussion damage to his cerebral vascular system was quite possible. And he was already showing signs of this during hospitalisation on the Western Front. In the end, I couldn't rule out his death had been caused by his Gallipoli service and he was ushered, rather affectionately by then, over the line into eligibility. Another we medically examined was 11th and 51st Battalion Private Joseph Adlam, who died from valvular heart disease in 1919, aged 38. He was initially eligible, but I needed to determine whether his 1915 Gallipoli service directly contributed to his death. He was an alcoholic with double aortic and mitral valve disease, palpitations and anemia. He was a dead man walking. But was it because of his Gallipoli service? To assess this case, I convened the International Medical Forensic Panel involving a team of specialists from Seattle, three Australian GPs, half a dozen nurses, and a friend who's an emergency specialist and the head of anesthesiology at Royal Perth and Fiona Stanley Hospitals. 
Their expert opinions came in. Several months and many thousands of words later, Adam's status was revised. His death was not caused by his Gallipoli service, but rather from a childhood bout of rheumatic fever. That's how closely we examined these men. A simple email triggered this next man's profound effect on the eligibility criteria, resulting in the inclusion by submission of men who fought for other forces and not just with the AIF as it had been initially. This is Captain Christopher Andrews of the Plymouth Battalion, Royal Marines. One of two on our list and both are called Christopher. What are the odds? This Christopher was a career soldier who resigned his commission and came to WA with his brother Lance in 1911 to farm at Margaret River. Another brother, Cecil, was already here. An interesting aside is that he was WA's Director of Education, after whom Cecil Andrews Senior High School is named. Cecil's brilliant daughter, Evelyn, was also one of PLC's early scholars. In August 1914, when World War I was declared, Christopher was recalled to active service in England with the British forces. This photo and the following information is from his grandniece, Penelope Ransby. On the trip ship to England, after being recalled, he wrote to Cecil, I didn't like leaving the Margaret at all. I'm sure it is one of the choicest spots in the world. I fully expect to be back before the end of next year. In another letter, a few months later, he wrote, I'm longing to get back to the dear old Margaret and never want to leave it again. In September, Lance joined the 16th Battalion. Rather poignantly, the brothers were together at Limnos in April and both landed at Gallipoli on the 25th. Christopher at Y Beach with the Royal Marines and Lance at Anzac Cove with the AIF. A week later, Lance was wounded at Bloody Angle and sent to England to recuperate. At Crithia, nine days after that, Christopher was killed by a sniper. His men were devastated. Private Horace Bruckshaw wrote in his diary, Poor Captain Andrews, we've lost our best friend. A mound, a small wooden cross and a few pebbles mark the last resting place of as brave a gentleman as ever walked. Lance, recuperating in England, then transferred to the Royal Marines so he could return to Gallipoli and visit his brother's grave. He was then deployed to the Western Front where he was killed on the Somme in 1918. Christopher had only been here three years, but the war, had the war not intervened, from his letters, we know he'd clearly have chosen to spend the rest of his life here. It was then I decided I would not set a minimum period of time for these men to have lived in WA before declaring them eligible. Now you can see, case by case, man by man, how we determined the number of West Australian soldiers killed at Gallipoli, or who later died from sickness or wounds. As Rob said in my introduction, Everyone got involved in this project as I did, on a voluntary basis. I didn't seek funding because grant writing does my head in and I just wanted to get in and get it done. Similarly, I wanted the results of the project freely available for anyone who wished to access and use them. And so the official list was released in the WA Genealogical Society journal Western Ancestor and also online on the WAGS site and in the April issue of the RSL magazine The Listening Post, which is available online. And the West Australian published the entire list with a front page banner headline and three fabulous pages just before Anzac Day. Throughout this year's Anzac centenary, our list has been used many, many times. One lovely example was the Gallipoli 100 surf boat marathon, which took place in the Dardanelles in April. The boats from Cottesloe and Trig Island Surf Life Saving Clubs both carried all the names of our Gallipoli dead inside. The Premier and I both spoke at that launch. It was a little surreal to hear him quoting our stats. As crowds gathered at Kings Park for the Anzac Day Dawn service, our 1,023 names were projected onto the War Memorial as each man's name was announced by students from Greenmount Primary School. The first name Claire Greer heard, remember, she looked at the Beijing files with me, was Royce Beiju. He seems to hang around like that. Later that day, the RSL released 1,023 red helium balloons from the bell tower, each one representing a name on our list. And for the 10th Light Horse Regiment exhibition at this year's Royal Show, I extracted a list of the 162 10th Light Horsemen who died. It was beautifully printed and central to the exhibition, which was magnificent. Actually, I was mentioned a couple of times in the speeches, so afterwards the, um, a couple of journalists came up and said, we believe you were involved in the display. I said, yes, I was. 
And they said, could we take a photo with you? I said, yeah, sure. And as we're walking towards it, one of them says, so how long did it take you to crochet all these? <laughs> I said, do I look like I can crochet? I just leave a list in the middle. <laughs> all year, in all media, radio, print and television, everyone has been quoting our stats. We remain the only state that knows them. Once we'd achieved the project goal and gathered the number of men lost and their names, I wanted to examine the data. I wrote a simple database. So this is the database I wrote, a very simple one, which allowed me to examine some really interesting statistics. Because of our data, there's now a lot of potential research material for anyone interested in looking. I examined things like the men's birthplaces. From that, I could see the majority of 586, or 57%, were born in Australia. The next largest group was the UK, with 392. 17 were born in New Zealand, and 28 born elsewhere. Of the largest group born in Australia, most, 251, were born in Victoria, followed by WA with 147, then 81 from South Australia, 76 from New South Wales, 20 from Queensland, and 12 from Tasmania. Of those born in the UK, you can see 292 were born in England, 64 in Scotland, 26 in Ireland, and 10 in Wales. Birthplaces for the 28 men born outside Australia, New Zealand and the UK are internationally diverse. Six from South Africa, three each from Denmark and Sweden, two each from Canada and India, and one each from Brazil, Ceylon, Holland, Hungary, Latvia, Malta, Mauritius, North America, Norway, Singapore, Switzerland and the West Indies. Next I broke down where they enlisted. Naturally, regardless of birthplace, most enlisted in WA. That's 973 or 95%. Of the remaining 5%, 5 men enlisted in New South Wales, 17 in Victoria, 3 each in South Australia and Queensland, Two who enlisted in England, there are two Royal Marines, and an alleged stowaway who enlisted on the high seas, Thomas Lakeland from Country WA. Then I broke down the deaths per month, which showed the most fatal month was August, when they launched the second or August offensive, with 347 men killed. Averaged, that's 11 men killed every day. May is next with 282, that's nine per day. Then comes April with 168. But remember, having landed on the 25th, they only fought for six days in April. And therefore it's the highest average at 28 men per day for each of those six days. And remember, that's just West Australians. You can see things become rapidly less fatal for our men after the failure of the August offensive down to the evacuation with only 11, month, 11 deaths for the whole month of December. Our data now shows us that over the 241 days our troops were at Gallipoli, an average of 4.2 men were killed per day, every single day, and that 98% of our men died in 1915. That last column represents the other 2%, or the 19 West Australians who died between the 1st of January 1916 and the 31st of August 1921. One of them is 23-year-old 11th Battalion Private James Bennett's Holder. He scraped in just one day before the eligibility cut-off. He was wounded in action at Gallipoli twice. The first was a shot in the arm from which he recovered and was sent back into action. In the second, he suffered horrendous injuries from a bomb blast in which he lost his right eye and half his jaw. If that wasn't enough, he returned to West Lederville having contracted TB and died on the 30th of August, 1921. The ages the men gave on their enlistment range in age from 17 to 47. Very interesting. I was told the average age of those who were killed at Gallipoli was 23, but by my calculations, it was a bit higher. And Michael Gregg recently refined the actual ages, which increased the average age to 27.4. But there was a lot of lying going on in the youngest and oldest groups. One of those was Hugh O'Donnell, who said he was just 19 years old and one month but was really just 15 when he enlisted and 16 when he was killed. At the other end of the spectrum is Richard Chase, who said he was 47, but I suspect he was about 54. 
There are also those who lied about their names, sometimes delaying their families finding out about their loved one for years. An interesting one who didn't look eligible on paper was 1st Battalion Bugler, Harry Hart, who enlisted under the name Edward Illart. Harry was born in Melbourne and deserted from the Navy after a year in April 1914. When war was declared in August, he enlisted in the AIF at Randwick, New South Wales, aged 25. Afraid his naval desertion would come to light, he gave his name as Edward Elart. He never intended revealing his true identity, but in May 1915 at Gallipoli, two of his best mates were killed either side of him. In his own words, it made him realise that the honour of death may now be any man's. On the 25th of May, he wrote a letter to his CO confessing his desertion, hoping the authorities would consider his time in the AIF as part of his naval commitment and offering to serve the rest of his time with the Navy when he came home. His captain endorsed him as a terrific soldier, adding, in my opinion, he has fully repaid his country for the trouble he has caused. Harry was out on patrol about 10 days later when he was fatally wounded. With no connection to WA, he was initially marked ineligible, but a tiny red flag was that someone had placed an obituary for him in WA's Western Mail. In his service record was a letter from his sister, Mrs Marshall, in Victoria, which said Harry went to live with another sister, Mrs Turner, in WA when their mother died. I needed to know who his mother was, where she died, and how long he lived with Mrs Turner before joining the Navy in 1913. While I looked into his mother, I asked for help from the Facebook group, and this was Claire Greer's first case. Claire soon found this plaintive letter on trove from his sister Gertrude Turner after he died. She states emphatically her brother did not belong to New South Wales, but just enlisted there, that he'd attended James Street School and spent the latter part of his short life in WA. Further, we identified his mother and that she died here in 1905. Given his young age at the time, we can presume he was living with her here then, and then he lived here with Gert. He was eligible. Next is Henry George Samuel Bultz from Dowran, who fought and died under the surname Lather. His mother, Loveday, sought to have her son's correct name on the gravestone, and it was only in reading her letter we learned why Henry Bultz became Henry Lather. Loveday wrote, it was after making eight previous unsuccessful attempts to enlist. Eight. He thought Bultz sounded too foreign and was afraid it was why he was being rejected. And maybe he was right because he was immediately accepted under Lather. Next is a soldier I eventually found ineligible, but he led me on a merry chase. A WA enlistee, he suffered such chronic dysentery he was sent to England to recuperate in November 1916. At Christmas, he wrote to Hilda, his wife, and John, his young son, by then over in Stall, Victoria. He, was, he said he was in England and getting better. He went on a fortnight's furlough from the New Year's Day 1917 and was due back on the 16th of January. But that was the last anyone ever heard of him. The army considered him absent without leave and halted his pay effective the day he failed to return. Poor Hilda wrote increasingly frantic letters pleading that they reinstate his pay to no avail. As this man's Gallipoli service was the original cause of his dysentery, I needed to investigate whether he'd died in England while on furlough, or if at least he'd lived past the 31st of August, 1921. I failed to find his death, so he is ineligible, but on a hunch, checked the London marriages and found this bigamous scoundrel <laughs> marrying a local lass at the chapel around the corner from the hospital on the morning of 16th of January 1917, the very day he was supposed to report back for duty. Can you read his name, this bigamous scoundrel? It's Casanova. <laughs> and he was, by name and by nature. You can't write this stuff, seriously. I had to see what happened to poor Hilda, who lost her husband as surely as if he died, but was never afforded the honour of being a war widow. She stayed in store and died aged 90 in 1971, most likely never learning he'd taken on another wife and lived another life. I thought of tracking down his son's family, but that was not news I felt I could break. The next couple I'll tell you about is Private Henry Wallace Williams and his friend Lieutenant Kieran Anderson. Henry, 35, enlisted first, and when Kieran, 23, followed, his worried mother asked Henry to look after him. 
Both were in the 16th Battalion. Henry was in B Company and Kieran, D. During training in Egypt, Henry applied for transfer to D Company to be with Kieran. On the 15th of April 1915, they boarded the ship in Alexandria together. Remember this moment, I'll bring you back to it shortly. The two friends made it through the landing, but a week later, both were in the disastrous charge up Bloody Angle on the 2nd of May, a night that decimated the battalion and nearly broke its spirit. The men struggled up the cliff as it crumbled steadily beneath them, but they knew they must go on. Someone began singing Tipperary, and soon every man joined in, coming close to drowning out the crack of rifle fire and the scream of shells. 16th Battalion signaller Ellis Silas described the scene in his diary. Every rifle, every gun opened up simultaneously. A murderous enfilade from the enemy's right swept that hillside with a rain of lead. Men withered away under it, the wounded screaming in their agonies rolled down the sheer slope, filling the gully below with a mass of writhing human flesh, soaking the gully in a torrent of blood. Dead and wounded were everywhere, described as poor shattered things crawling along in their agony. And at dawn, the 16th Battalion was a withered remnant. The top of Bloody Angle was later named Dead Man's Ridge for the number of men who fell there. Henry and Kieran were there at the top when Kieran was shot dead. Henry, beside him, was killed a moment later, his body falling over Kieran's. Battalion Captain Goldie saw them, but in the chaos, their deaths went unrecorded. Now I bring you back to that moment when they boarded the ship together in Alexandria. Henry's application to transfer to Kieran's company was still being processed, and Henry was therefore still on B Company's muster roll. He was not checked off because he embarked with Kieran in D Company instead. Henry was therefore reported illegally absent from that day. His family, filled with shame, went through the entire war believing he was a coward, that he'd absconded from Egypt as the troops were embarking for battle, and in February 1919 he was officially declared a deserter. But in 1922, during the Gallipoli exhumations, Henry's identity disc and badges were recovered. Here was the proof he'd made it to Gallipoli. A court of inquiry gathered and witness statements were finally presented. Captain Goldie, appalled to realise there was any confusion over Henry's whereabouts, made this statement that cleared him. Yes, I remember him. He landed at Gallipoli on the 25th of April with the D Company. He was killed in action at Dead Man's Ridge on the night of the 2nd and 3rd of May. I saw him dead there. Captain Goldie then explained the reason Henry had applied to transfer to D Company to be with Lieutenant Anderson, who he had promised to look after. And he explained how, as all the officers from D Company had been killed, he'd been sent to take charge of what was left. Whilst there, I saw Williams lying dead across Lieutenant Anderson, who was also dead. The 1922 evidence fully restored Henry's honour, and he was retrospectively declared killed in action at Bloody Angle on the 2nd of May, 1915. But for seven years, he'd been an embarrassment to his friends, his family and Australia branded a deserter and a coward, when in truth he'd done his duty and lain dead on foreign soil all that time. Henry's parents died before his name was cleared. But Kieran's mother, Mary Anderson, was still alive. Judging from this notice in the West Australian of July 1922, it looks like Henry's sister found and told Mrs Anderson that Henry had kept his promise and that he was with her boy when they met to the end together. So I've told you about dead men walking, a Royal Marine, some loving sons, an honourable scallywag, an outright scoundrel and a bona fide hero. We're inclined to view all these men as heroes, but there's a difference between bravery and heroism. Far from all were heroes. I'd like to tell you about my anti-hero, 10th Light Horse Trooper Arthur Hancock, 31 years old. He caught my eye during the research phase of the project I saw his wife had died before enlistment and later that his boys were in an orphanage. Arthur was killed in the suicidal charge of the 8th and 10th Light Horse Regiments at the Neck on the 7th of August. Due to two officers not synchronising their watches, a fierce naval bombardment supposed to last half an hour stopped seven minutes early and unsure if it would resume, the troops were held until the appointed time to charge. The Ottoman soldiers, who'd fled with the first firing, used those seven minutes to file back into their trenches just a few yards away from our boys and steadily aimed their machine guns. 
As the whistle blew, four waves each of 150 men launched themselves up and over the parapets to run across an open field, their rifles unloaded. No more help than pointy sticks in the face of machine gun fire. Each line was cut down almost to a man within seconds. Watching, each successive line knew their fate and they made their goodbyes and decided, if now was their time, they would go bravely. Not one Australian made it to the Turkish trenches. Wilfred Harper came close. Charles Bean wrote later, the 24-year-old Guildford boy from Woodbridge, was last seen running like a schoolboy in a foot race with all the speed he could compass. In 45 minutes, it was all over. This was, of course, the closing scene in Peter Weir's 1981 film, Gallipoli. The inspiration for the movie being Bean's description of Wilfred Harper's run. Of those last two lines from the holy West Australian 10th Light Horse, Charles Bean wrote, With that regiment went the flower of the youth of Western Australia, sons of the old pioneering families, youngsters, in some cases two and three from the same home, who'd flocked to Perth at the outbreak of war with their own horses and saddlery. Men, known and popular, the best loved leaders, then rushed straight to their deaths. In 1919, when Bean and the Graves Registration Unit went through Gallipoli's battlefields, the remains of more than 300 men who died that day were still lying where they fell four years before. That space was no larger than three tennis courts, and this is the next cemetery. Those who died that day included Wilfred Harper and his brother Gressley, and my anti-hero, Arthur Hancock. So at first glance, and admittedly mine are usually through rose-coloured glasses, I thought, how sad. An ostensibly honourable widower killed at Gallipoli, his cherished sons ending up in an orphanage. But oh no, I had it all wrong. After a brash and rather novel but successful approach to courtship, you'll have to read the book if you want the details, he and his wife Jessie came to WA with their baby boy, Henry. Their second son, Jack, was born in Fremantle in 1910. In early 1912, Arthur gave his wife half a sovereign, that's about $50 today, told her he had work in the country and left. Jessie and their infant sons, nearly three and 19 months, then slipped quietly into abject poverty. They were in a truly shocking state by the time the authorities intervened. The boys were removed to the State Children's Department and Jessie was sent to the women's home in Fremantle. Arthur, back in town and making a drunken nuisance of himself, was charged with wife desertion. At the trial, he said he had money. He just had to buy things for himself and he didn't have anything to spare for his wife and sons. Despite care, a few weeks later, Jessie died. He was no honourable widower and he was no loving father. Jessie died nearly three years before Arthur enlisted and having left his wife to starve to death, he then left his sons in state care and they spent most of their childhoods at Swan Boys Home. I tracked down Jack's children, who believed Jessie, their grandmother, had died in childbirth with him. When I very carefully told them what had happened, they said it was fortunate Henry had never had children, as Jack was bad enough as a father. But those grandchildren had Jessie's genes too, and broke the cycle of drunkenness and violence. They cried when I told them Jessie was buried at Fremantle Cemetery, and on the 10th of September this year, the whole family visited her grave for the first time since she died 103 years ago. Now you probably understand why so many of these men and their relatives are still with me and why I found them so interesting and why I then turned to the stories that were clamouring while we crunched the numbers. In January last year, David Cohen from Post Newspapers did a fabulous story on the project and with Susan Mousehart's encouragement, I asked if they'd be interested in featuring one Gallipoli dead from Western Australia soldier every week in the lead up to the Anzac centenary. This was in the spirit of Lest We Forget and in an effort to skew our collective consciousness away from this bloke, arguably the best known of the men on our list. I wanted to shine a light on the others to make their stories known. Without knowing if I could write a single word, Brett Christian from The Post said yes. He gave me a 150 word limit and one photo. But from this very first story, I found it hard to sum up someone's life and death, or in fact to do their bravery and sacrifice justice in so few words. And then the Post and I embarked on a remarkable journey of growth and trust, which has taken me down a wonderful, unexpected path. Before long, I was up to 600 words. 
The Anzac issue of 2014 was my first half page. By the time I finished this series, 15 months and 60 odd stories later, my limit was about 1,200, but they regularly let me break 1,500, and my last was almost a full page. Each story took me four days. I picked who I'd write about on Fridays. Saturdays were spent researching everything there was to know about him and his family. If I couldn't find a photo of him, I'd map his entire family tree and track down relatives to ask if they had one. Sometimes it meant a quick jaunt to the country with Peter, my friend and navigator, and my laptop and scanner, always well worth the trip. This is Herbert Hallett, a Parkerville orphan. When he died, the women in his life went to war. Again, you'll have to read the book if you want to know more about that. There was no chance of scanning this as it's framed and hanging high up on the wall in the chapel at Sister Kate's in Queen's Park. I managed to contact a retired magistrate, Sue Gordon, a Sister Kate's girl, who met us at the chapel on Sunday the next day. She then helped us move the pews and blocked the light from the windows so I could get the perfect shot. In the reflection of a fuller shot, you can actually see me balance very precariously on the back of a pew. These beautiful ones of the Moore family meant a drive to Mandurah but we were rewarded with some of the best banana cake we've ever eaten and a gorgeous afternoon with a woman who later said it was the best day she'd had in years as she could discuss her family and I knew who she was talking about. Another I tracked down was an economics professor from Adelaide University on holiday for his birthday long weekend in the country. He drove three hours back to Adelaide and scanned this photo of Davy Harson for me. It was the fourth version I'd tracked down and the other three were very poor copies and I didn't hold out much hope for this one being any better. I felt very guilty interrupting his holiday. But it was so much better. More, he sent me a scan of the back with a personal message and a poignant passage from Tennyson, plus the vital clue of a Perth photographer. That tiny detail allowed me to date this photo to late 1913 and place him as having played at his sister's wedding in December. It's an excellent lesson to always check the back of your photos. For these ones of the Knapp family, I spent a Sunday teaching one lovely man in Esperance how to use a printer scanner over the phone. <laughs> then I united four different branches of their family all over the place and shared the scanned photos with all of them. A few months later, they invited me to their family reunion. I did go to extraordinary lengths to help to find these photos, but I never hit anyone who didn't go to just as extraordinary lengths to help me. All I needed to do was ask, and these good people followed me straight down the rabbit hole. After writing all Sunday, I submitted each story on a Monday, along with an enormous sigh of relief. I didn't write solely about battles, strategies and war tactics. I wrote about more important things. Who these men were, how their families loved them, and how they came to terms with the loss of their dear boy. Social histories, if you like. Every single man has an interesting story. I just had to find it. One lovely lady said to me, if you're interested in Gallipoli, you might like these articles in the post. There's one every week. <laughs> <laughs> in August last year, these stories were deemed to exhibit research excellence and applied critical thinking and were launched into WA's education curriculum. They're now used to teach World War I history to years three, six and nine. In September, I received an email of congratulations from Susan Mousehart followed a split second later by a call from David Cohen, who confessed he'd entered my stories into the WA Media Awards without telling me. He was ringing to tell me I was one of four finalists up for Best Columnist, the Matthew Price Award, alongside proper paid journalists. I was truly speechless, but really just for a moment. Andrew Probin won, but I was absolutely thrilled to be included. So what's next? Firstly, with enormous thanks to Di and Ken Collins, of the Rotary Club Freshwater Bay, the National Trust and Post Newspapers, the book Gallipoli Remembered, containing all of these stories and more, will be launched next year. In the back will be the name of every West Australian soldier who died as a result of their Gallipoli service. And secondly, exactly as no one knew how many West Australians were killed at Gallipoli, no one knows how many were killed on the Western Front. So the Gallipoli Dead's sister project, Western Front Dead from Western Australia, will begin in February. I've already extracted the base data and built a team of 20 research volunteers, some of whom are here tonight, including those from the Gallipoli Project along with some others I've brought on board. I also have commitments from six members of the medical forensic team to assess the borderline cases. This is a much larger project and I expect the research phase to take nearly two years 
after which we'll have all the same kind of stats for the Western Front that we've been able to extract from the Gallipoli dead from Western Australia data. I also ask if I can resume writing weekly stories for the Post newspaper in the lead up to the Armistice Centenary, this time on lads lost in the Western Front. Finally, I think you can see, as each soldier was examined, they briefly came to life. I think you can see they caught our attention, earned our affection and stayed with us long after their file was closed. Regardless of their eligibility, the stories of these men, from all walks of life and all ages and stages, demanded to be heard. With the Gallipoli and Western Front dead from Western Australia projects, we are naming those lost and their stories are coming to light. And with that I shall close, thank you, and open the floor to questions. Any questions? Just to express my admiration for the work that you've done, and hopefully I can throw a curly one at you and I can your statistics. 1,043 West Australians was, was the figure, was it? 1,023. 1,023. How many were Boer War veterans? That's a really good question, and maybe you can answer that one for me. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I am the Secretary of the Cornwall Memorial Society and I'll take it on board. <laughs> Next question. Thank you for your question, Shannon. Uh, Warwick Archer from South Australia. I came over to, was invited over to listen to this, uh, this talk. So, uh, oh, well, wow, well. thank you for coming. <laughs> I was in Gallipoli uh, uh, 2015 with the surfboat rowers and uh, I had a mission while I was there, having been to Gallipoli before and uh, in Istanbul many times, uh, uh, two things, to visit the Florence Nightingale Museum in uh, Selamir Barracks uh, on the uh, Asiatic side of, uh, of Istanbul and the other nearby is a cemetery called the Haida Pasha Commonwealth War Cemetery. Uh, a little visited, but uh, very moving. And I was just wondering, uh, I searched some of the names, but not all. There are about 27 Australians, I think, uh, whose, um, whose names are in that cemetery. And I did search some to see if they died in captivity. Uh, did you include uh, in your uh, 1,023 uh, a search like that to uh, find those who may have been at Gallipoli and then subsequently died in Turkish? Captivity. Yes, I did. Um, through the Commonwealth War Graves Commission extraction, that, that included all prisoners of war buried anywhere in the world. Thank you. Sir. And you must have been on the same plane as my Uncle Terry, who flew over. He was one of my brilliant volunteers, and he arrived as a, as a surprise from Adelaide this afternoon. Thanks for coming, yes, Terry. Sir. There's a question here. Yes. I, I remember um, who it was that you said that. That particular soldier is John Casanova, and I don't know that. I mean, he's ineligible for the project, and I only tended to write about the ones who were eligible. And I'm not sure that I could break the news that their father actually ended up living another life in England. So no, I probably won't write about him, but maybe I should. Do you think I should? <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thanks, Shannon. Uh, it's, um, thanks for those uh, the, the stats and the graphs that are really interesting. I've got an um, interesting question. I believe that uh, a lot died of illness, and I wouldn't mind knowing what the percentage those who died of uh, battlefield wounds and those that died from illness. That's in the process of being worked out as we speak, because that that will be very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, the, in the West, at some stage, they had a photograph of all those from West Australia that were at, uh, on the pyramid, and they were trying to identify these gentlemen by a matrix and my grandfather's two brothers were there 
and one of them died on the 25th and his name was on the main part of the And I couldn't, I've got a photograph of him and I could not identify him and I sent the photograph to my cousin in Kalgoorlie and we both had a good hard look at the men on the pyramid trying to identify the facial similarities that we had and we came up with about 11 different names each. Is there, is there any way we can get a sort of larger photograph of that one on the pyramid to try and see what if they're there? I'm actually a little involved with that project um, and yes, if you contact WAGS, they will be happy to send you um, a photograph of that, a large, you know, high resolution one. Well, there is a high resolution one on the website. Um, is that Liana there? Yes, WAGS is uh, Liana, the president of the WA Genealogical Society, is right behind you and she can tell you a lot more than I can. <laughs> trying to identify the men. We've identified 250 of the 704 men. But if you want to see a really big photo, the John Curtin Gallery in Curtin Uni has got a display and it finishes, I think, on the 25th of this month. It's 10 metres by 8 metres. It is a wonderful one to go and see. But also we have got a website where you can look at those photos. But talk to me afterwards and we all get a copy of your photo. Apart from that, I can suggest try and find as many photos of your soldier that you can, because he might have been smiling or looking another way or have a hat on, as they you know, often did. So get as many photos as you can to um, get different angles of his face. Hello, Jan. I just want to suggest my with Australian Army. My oh. goal is on the Western Australian Regional Indigenous Liaison Officer. In your research, have you identified any of these members as being of Aboriginal descent? Yes, we have one, James Dickerson, 10th Light Horse Trooper. Um, he is the only uh, Aboriginal West Australian killed at Gallipoli. I'm sure there will be a lot more on the Western Front. I'll just read these beautiful words from Ataturk and his memorial in 1934 at Anzac Cove. Those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives you are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmets to us, where they lie side by side now, here in this country of ours. You, the mothers, who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their sons on this land, they have become our sons as well. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, something less talked about. Uh, you had a cut off period from the date, uh, I think it was uh, 1921. Did you uh, have any inclusion of suicide? Yes, I did. I only have one suicide, and um, I actually debated whether or not to talk about him tonight because he's very interesting. With a really bad case of VD, he was actually sent home and he was on the ship when he had some kind of mania and he had been locked in his cabin um, and he fought his way out screaming and running up the stairs still screaming he threw himself over the side of the ship still screaming and his mother thought that he was on his way home and she was expecting him home by Christmas it was a complete mystery to her because of course they never revealed VD as being the cause of a soldier's illness and of course he had suicided. She probably wondered why he did that and maybe wondered if she was going to one day go insane herself. If you want to contact me, I can email you a little bit more about him. He's very interesting. Last year's speaker, what can I say? That was absolutely marvellous. You have validated for me something which I tell people when they do family history research, and that is start at the end, start with the death. It's, it's totally counterintuitive, but if you have a tricky family history problem, start with a dead person and work backwards. And so much easier when they die. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the only thing you know about the person is that they died. So it's not such a wonderful example of how you started at the right end and it really paid off. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Philippa. Any other questions? Just one there, Charlie. 
Charlie is the descendant or relative of one of my boys, Bertie Newbury. Okay, thank you, Shannon, for uh, I just ask you, apart from the Facebook uh, page, is there any anywhere for depositing sort of further information or whatever that might come to light about any of these things? I think so. Where's Michael Gregg? He's going to be doing a bit of work on our database, so maybe we can build it out to hold that extra information because that's what I did design it for so that we could actually consult it later and so that everyone can consult it and have a look at all the notes on the soldiers and bring them back to life basically. So yes, I think um, send it to me Charlie and I'll put it in the right place. <laughs> That's not a silly question. And the only silly question is one that's never asked, okay? Remember that for next time. I have released the number as 1023, but the project is not closed. And I remain open for submission um, of soldiers who fought under other forces. And if, any, if I've missed any, I'm more than happy to be correcting the record and adding them to the list, because we do want to get everyone. I'm 98% confident that I've got all of them with the available resources we have. There are always going to be some that slip through the net, and if Bill Edgar will forgive me for um, mentioning one of the men for whom they had a plaque in their honour garden, uh, which was to mark all the deceased who died in wars, and they advertised that in the um, Old Haley and in the newspaper, and one of the guys ran and said, hey, can I come to that ceremony? He wasn't dead. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to be presented with information that will add to the file and to the correctness of the record. It's all about being correct. Just a quick one about not being dead. I'm the secretary of the York RSL and I'm really happy to be here tonight. But I had a, information from headquarters that somebody had died. So I contacted a lot of people around and said, no way, he's not. Who was it? So they had the wrong names. So it can happen. It can. And my work as archivist, believe me, um, I have actually run people that I've, you know, thought couldn't possibly be dead, and they're not. But um, you know, a rumour does go around, so I always like to check with two or three sources before I actually report the death. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Any more? Thank you very okay, much. I'm now very pleased to invite uh, Acting President of Cottesloe ARSL, Jonathan Sciatino, to come forward to move a vote of thanks to Shannon. Thank you, Jonathan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to extend, uh, firstly, a heartfelt thanks to all of you for attending tonight's uh, annual Fred Bell VC Memorial Lecture. Over the years, this event has grown in stature and it's begun to establish its place in the list of must-attend events during the year. As a consequence, we've seen the numbers attending the event grow steadily each year. And uh, thanks to your generous donations on the way in, that means that the RSL can raise more funds uh, to be used for the welfare of our veterans and their families, so thank you very much for that. I've noted that it may well be Friday the 13th, but I think you'd all agree that tonight's lecture has reassured us all that Friday the 13th can't possibly be all that bad. Besides, what better way to lead into a beautiful November weekend in Perth, featuring Prince Charles's 67th birthday celebrations, he's having a soiree up on the lawn tomorrow, further proof if you needed it that events in Cottesloe are definitely the place to be. <laughs> Uh, anecdotal evidence suggests that most people, uh, and this is people I've spoken to, uh, see the Fred Bell Lecture each year as an opportunity to deepen their knowledge on historical matters of significance. Tonight, we've been treated to an outstanding presentation by our guest speaker, Shannon Lovelady. I'm leaving tonight with a greater appreciation of the stories of Western Australian heroes, brave soldiers, scallywags, scoundrels, and anti-heroes. Stories that are both emotional and utterly fascinating. I've also understood that while there were very few happy endings, there is much to be said for closure, however unexpected it might be. And finally, I now know exactly whom 
I should seek help from and inspiration from should I find myself needing to research a mission impossible. We should never underestimate the passion of volunteers. On behalf of the Cottesloe RSL sub-branch and the town of Cottesloe, I'm sure you will join me in thanking our guest speaker tonight, Shannon Lovelock. Now I'd like uh, Jonathan to move a vote of thanks to Cheryl Lee McCready, a Community Development and Events Officer at the Town of Cottesloe. Cheryl Lee is a perennial contributor to the Frederick Bell VC Memorial Lecture. She works tirelessly to put together amazing events. She's an absolute credit to the Town of Cottesloe. An event like tonight's lecture simply would not be achieved without her efforts. And the RSL uh, Cottesloe sub-branch would not be able to achieve much of what it does without her expert assistance, her organisational talent and her unconditional support. Would you please join me in thanking Cheryl Lee McCready from the Town of Cottesloe. Just before I go, it would be remiss of me not to take this opportunity to thank the Cottesloe RSL sub-branch members who have assisted in setting up for tonight's event, as well as our esteemed Master of Ceremonies, Mr Rob O'Connor. Rob has been instrumental in planning and executing tonight's lecture. Would you please join me in thanking our RSL members and our MC. Thanks very much. My own personal thanks to Shannon. We've been very privileged to hear such a professional presentation by her this evening. It is wonderful news that Shannon has announced this evening that in February she will embark on the even bigger project of the Western Front dead from Western Australia, which will take a couple of years to complete. This represents incredible community spirit, commitment and dedication to the Western Australian people by Shannon. My thanks too to Shirley for all her hard work and assistance given to me in ensuring that this evening would be the great success that it has been. I also thank the Mayor and councillors of the Town of Cottesloe uh, who have provided this excellent venue for the lecture and for providing, at the town's cost, all the food and drinks for this function, which will continue after this event. Uh, yeah, uh, my thanks in particular to Councillor Helen Burke, who made and donated the chicken sandwiches. <laughs> there are two publications on sale this evening at the back of the hall. First, the book, Not Just a Name, 1914 to 1918, Service Men and Women, written by Dr Neville Green, AM, with Anne Barwood and Lynn Manalini. It gives biographical details of almost 1,000 men from Cottesloe, Mosman Park and Peppermint Grove who served in World War I. The book was published earlier this year by Cottesloe RSL and is selling tonight at $20 per copy. The second publication is The Western Mail War Souvenir Christmas 1915, which has been republished by Fremantle historian and collector John Dowson. It is full of Gallipoli stories and photos and advertisements. It also will be on sale at the back of the hall. John Dowson is on hand to sign the publication if you so wish. $19.95 or two for $30. And John has very generously offered to give half of the sale proceeds 
to Cottesloe RSL. The publication would be an excellent Christmas gift. Uh, John told me that one lady bought 22 copies to give one to each member of her extended family at Christmas. Finally, if you are a former serviceman or servicewoman, or if your mother or father served in a war and you would like to become a member or affiliate member of Cottesloe RSL, you can obtain an application form from Graham Johnson at the desk at the door. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all again for attending and you are most welcome to stay to mix and to enjoy the drinks and food provided. Thank you.